Well, I'm glad it's about standards and ethics. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, the first years of VR, we all know, has been mainly experimental, and we we're just trying to see what the technology would do. And every project came up with its own ethical concept, its own constructs, which is, which is just fine to start out. Um, but now baby's grown up, and VR news is something that we, it's part of our lives now. And in the next few years, maybe the next one, two years, millions of people are going to be forming lifetime beliefs about what VR news is. So it's time for a conversation about VR standards. Um, when you talk about still images, people understand that an image can be the event itself, or it can be an artist's impression of the event, or it can be a commentary. But those things can blend together in a VR presentation. Producers do start with reality, but there's a great temptation to take some artistic license. Some people say the medium requires a certain amount of artistic license. And the sheer immersive power of VR can pull you so far into the scene that you emerge with a strong political or social opinion, probably the one that the producer intended. One of the biggest VR producers makes a point of doing news coverage that leads viewers to take action. Riot says it shows you what's going on in the world and what you can do about it. So that's the first standards question. Will there be a space and a market for objectivity in VR news? Or will VR news production evolve principally into tools of persuasion to get people to donate money, to sign petitions, or to join a cause. My own view is that there's room for all of that, but providers need to be transparent about what they're trying to accomplish. The second standards question is how real VR imagery should be. Here's a presentation by the AP, my company, showing a super luxury hotel suite. This is 100% real. Everything is photographed precisely. You can walk around objects and see them as they really are um, from any side. Now we'll compare that to, um, to a couple other projects. This is a production by The Economist, designed to recreate a museum in Mosul, Iraq, that was destroyed by the Islamic State group. Producers digitally rebuilt the museum, room by room in CGI, and then they filled it with the original art objects. Well, sort of the original art objects. They recreated them in 3D from photos taken over the years by tourists. It's a fantastic use of VR to bring back something that had been destroyed. But the photos were taken by different tourists from different angles in two dimensions. So while the 3D objects look authentic, the VR creators acknowledge that they're not close enough to the original to provide scientific archaeological value. Well, here's a VR scene by Jamie's emblematic group of an explosion in Syria. It also was created from 2D video. But the other sides of major objects were verified with additional photographs. It wasn't done by guesswork. But in the future, hey, not all producers are likely to be as painstaking as emblematic. And if some of their imaging is pure guesswork, what do the other side of objects look like? Um, will they need disclosures? Will they care about disclosures? And what kind of disclosures would they be? Some kind of pre-roll text maybe saying that this work is a recreation based on a, on a true story. Or maybe producers will start to come up with devices other than text for disclosures. Here's that um, piece we saw yesterday and again uh, a bit of it today recounting the domestic violence incident that ended in a murder-suicide. Producers extensively interviewed witnesses as to who was standing where, even what clothes they were wearing. So that was just as precise as, as you could possibly make it. But what about, say, the facial expressions? I mean, that's really hard to know from, from witnesses what everyone's face looked like at the same time. Well, uncertainty in a situation like that might be conveyed by obscuring the exact expressions 
to make clear we don't know what they are. Well, that makes for a crummier experience, no, no question at all. But, you know, is that one of the trade-offs that we will learn to do um, for the sake of absolute reality or conveying that we don't know the absolute reality? Then there's a question of recreating an event that different witnesses saw in different ways. Dan Archer created this VR, uh, retelling the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, from the points of view of several different witnesses. You can use the map in the upper right to walk around through the scene and talk to different witnesses um, to get different accounts of what happened. The VR adds power to each witness's account, but the final decision on what to believe is up to the viewer. So here's another standards question. Should VR producers show the viewer everything the camera captures? Here are the bodies of migrant children three months ago on a beach in Turkey. Still, and video photographers, can select their angles. So if they want to avoid the children's faces, they can. But a VR camera sees everything. Uh, traditional journalistic standards say you should never manipulate the content of a photo. Well, should that apply in a situation like that? Now, we ran into that situation a lot less tragically in the recreation of that luxury hotel suite. The suite's bathroom had so many mirrors that we couldn't help the VR camera becoming part of the image. Now, someone might argue, well, hey, just, just take it out electronically. After all, hotel bathrooms don't usually have VR cameras in them. Um, but image integrity is, is pretty sacred at our organization, so, uh, so the camera stayed in. And what about inducing trauma with VR? Here's a report done by Animal Equality and Condition One about the suffering of pigs in a factory farm. If you're immersed in the slaughterhouse, as this VR lets you be, uh, with all of its sights and all of its sounds around you, can be a pretty scary experience. And someone told me the other day that after watching this production once, she became a vegetarian. And some might also might have a, um, a strong emotional reaction to this look by The Guardian at a solitary confinement cell in an American prison. As you turn around in the VR, you see exactly what the prisoner does. A drab cell, no distractions, where prisoners might be kept alone for days or weeks. So the science of VR on our brains is still very young. Uh, we don't know exactly how people can be affected by trauma within VR. But the more we learn, the more we may have to pay attention to warnings that we have to incorporate uh, pre-roll or within VR about where to look, where not to lurk. Um, there's a question of mobility. A lot of virtual reality is set up so you stand in one place and you look 360 degrees around you, as in this New York Times production on the suffering of refugee children. Um, you can see everything as you turn around in this bombed out classroom in Ukraine. But you're still rooted to the spot that the producer chose to begin with. If the VR technique lets you walk through a scene, you're still in a walled world selected by the producer. You can only make those turns the production allows. Should the producer provide some context about whether the solution was different a few blocks or a few miles away? And then some news companies say the complexities of VR force them to stage events or re-stage events, something they may never have done before. Now, here's a comment on that from an editor of the New York Times. Again, it raises the question of what VR is. Actual events or their recreation may be with a little variation from the original. All of this is not to criticize experimentation in VR journalism these days. There's a lot of brands of journalism and that may be fine when producers are transparent. But we can only gain, I think, from making sure that the conversation about VR ethics develops as quickly as VR itself. <laughs>